Hello everyone, uh, I'm George Christopoulos, I'm not an ALD expert, but I'm a gynecology doctor and I spent most of my time in the IVF unit at Hammersmith Hospital and I would like to thank you for the invite and for giving me the opportunity to speak to you about the pregnancy options and the pre-implantation or prenatal genetic diagnosis options that are currently available to people who are carriers of uh, genetic conditions. To give you an overview, um, firstly I'll give you a brief introduction to the methods available for genetic diagnosis. I will explain how it is done and how certain couples or patients might benefit from different procedures. We will go through the current status of affairs when it comes to what is offered on the NHS. And I would also like to touch briefly on the ethical challenges that we uh, are faced with every day when it comes to making decisions or reproductive choices for uh, patients under our care. Previously, uh, the only available reproductive choices uh, to patients uh, who were carriers of reproductive conditions were to remain childless, to avoid passing any genetic conditions to the offspring, or uh, aiming to complete their family through the means of adoption, or proceeding with spontaneous conception and natural pregnancy and understandably taking or accepting the risk of this reproductive roulette of whether the parents would pass any genetic disorders to their children. This has changed, and this has changed through the means of either prenatal diagnosis, which involves genetic tests that are performed during the first or the second trimester of pregnancy, or going even further back through gamete donations or a new method called pre-implantation <coughs> genetic diagnosis, which allows us to diagnose carriers or homozygotes for genetic conditions even before the embryo is transferred inside the uterus. <coughs> In pregnancy, uh, the diagnosis of genetic conditions uh, can be done firstly through a process called amniocentesis. Amniocentesis is a quick outpatient process that usually takes place after 15 weeks gestation and usually between 16 to 18 weeks. Uh, it involves uh, a, some local anesthetic at the skin of the abdomen and a very fine needle is passed inside the pregnant uterus and a small sample of the amniotic fluid surrounding the baby is taken and sent for genetic analysis. The good or the advantage of such a method is that it's very easy to do and it's very quick Patients come in the hospital, they stay in for half an hour, and they go home straight after. The disadvantages of the method, however, is that it can only be performed too late, or very late in the process of pregnancy, after a 16 weeks gestation, which means that we're well into the second trimester of pregnancy. And that brings the uh, question forward as to what can we do with these results at such a late stage. Additionally, it is an easy procedure, but it's not a completely safe procedure. So still, it has a 1% additional risk of miscarriage, and that means that we might be putting patients or couples or parents at risk of having a miscarriage of an absolutely healthy baby boy or baby girl. So following amniocentesis, we were able to do these genetic tests even earlier on during pregnancy during the 11th to 13th week gestation, which is just at the end of the first trimester. This method is called chorionic villus sampling, or CVS, um, with, and it involves passing a very fine needle through the abdomen and taking a very, very small sample from the baby's placenta to send it for genetic analysis. Similarly, it's an equally very easy method to perform. It's very quick. It allows for earlier detection of any gene abnormalities compared to amniocentesis, on the downside, however, it seems to have similar pregnancy losses compared to amniocentesis. These two methods are invasive methods of genetic testing for parents. However, we have now moved on beyond that to non-invasive prenatal testing. Non-invasive prenatal testing means that the mother comes in in the first trimester of pregnancy and has a blood test which is tested for DNA fragments. These DNA fragments are what we call cell-free fetal DNA. Essentially, in the maternal circulation, uh, we can find DNA fragments from the mother, 
but also very minuscule small DNA fragments from the unborn child. And these can be sent for analysis to detect whether we, the unborn baby, uh, the unborn child, is a boy or a girl. And that can help us make important decisions to excellent conditions such as ALD. On the disadvantages of this method is that in about 1 to 4% of cases, we do not get a result back, which means that we're not helping these couples, but we're only adding <coughs> to their uh, stress even more. And unfortunately, this method is still only privately funded, and it's not currently <coughs> a part of the routine NHS screening. Um, we can go even further back. So all these tests available so far are prenatal tests tests which occur between having a positive pregnancy test to having a life birth. Now with the advent of pre-implantation genetic diagnosis, these genetic tests can be performed even before someone has an embryo transfer or a positive pregnancy test. However, to do that, couples or women should or have to go through an IVF cycle in order to yield these embryos to test them and then transfer the unaffected embryos back in. And what does that mean for patients? It means that they have a treatment which lasts about, two to, about one to two weeks, on average about 12 days. The woman comes in on the first or second day of her menstrual cycle when her ovary is normal and quiet, having the follicles which contain the eggs inside. And what we do is we stimulate these ovaries by administering what we, uh, a recombinant FSH injections. These are hormonal injections that patients self-administer every day during this course of the 12-day period. Halfway through this treatment, the patient starts a second injection called a GnRH antagonist, which is an injection that will prevent all these follicles from ovulating prematurely before we can actually collect them. At the end of this period, the ovary has changed significantly. So going from an ovary with small follicles inside, many follicles, each of which contains one egg, have been stimulated for us to be able to collect. 36 hours after that scan, the patients come in and have a very quick oocyte uh, retrieval procedure, which is done under ultrasound guidance. Um, under deep sedation, uh, patients go home, uh, come in at about 8.30 in the morning. They leave the hospital at about 10.30, so they usually stay in for a couple of hours. We use a transvaginal ultrasound probe and a very fine needle to collect these eggs from the ovary, and these eggs will subsequently be fertilized with a partner sperm. To do that, we use a method called ICSI. This is the human egg after the collection through this method. And we use this very fine needle, which is not visible to the naked eye, and do what we call intracytoplasmic sperm injection, where a single sperm is injected into the center of the oocyte. We then observe these embryos, and this is a picture taken from a special incubator in our lab called the Embryoscope, which takes pictures of embryos as they're growing every 15 minutes. We are now on day two uh, of the life of the embryo, and the embryo has already divided into four cells. On day three, the embryo will divide from four cells to the six to eight cell stage, and this is a very active uh, process going on literally every few minutes uh, as we check the embryos. A few days later, around day five, what happens is that the embryo contains even more cells. And now we move on to day five of life, and this, uh, a small cavity forms in the middle of the embryo, and this is what we call the blastocyst. And in IVF terms, this is the perfect embryo, the embryo that has the best potential to implant during treatment. So how does all this come into play when it comes to diagnosing genetic conditions such as ALD? What we can do when embryos have been yielded through the process of IVF is actually biopsy these embryos and take one or two cells from them to send them for genetic analysis. So this is another embryo, and you can see it's at the three, at day three. It has about six to eight cells, 
And what we do with this process is essentially use a very fine pipette and a very, very fine laser beam to open a tiny hole at the cover of the cell. And what we do is we essentially take one or two cells out of the embryo and send it for genetic analysis. The cell has been obtained. The rest of the embryo is absolutely fine. And this little hole around the shell of the embryo doesn't matter because this shell will disappear as soon as the shell and the embryo implant inside the uterus. I am not an ALD expert, but ALD uh, makes is a significant uh, condition when it comes to my field of reproductive medicine because it has a great historical importance. The first ever treatment with pre-implantation genetic diagnosis was done at Imperial College uh, and Hammersmith Hospital by, for an ALD carrier back in 1990, even before the gene was actually identified. What we did know back then is that the condition was X-linked. So what we did is a M essentially sex the available embryos, find out what the sex of the embryo is, so we could select female embryos for transfer. The initial method used for that, for embryo section, is a method called FISH, or fluorescent in situ hybridization. This is a method where we use different color probes for different chromosomes, and you can see on picture A, this is a cell which contains uh, two copies of chromosome 18, for example, which is a blue color, and two copies of chromosome X, which means that we are talking about the cell of a female embryo. In a, uh, consequently, uh, in picture B, we see uh, a cell that comes from an embryo that has two blue markers, chromosome 18, and only one green marker, and this is suggestive that we're talking almost certainly about a male embryo. We have moved further from that in the sense that now we can do direct mutation testing in the cells that we collect for pre-implantation genetic diagnosis. The HFEA is the Human Fertilization and Embryology Authority, and it's the regulating authority uh, which regulates the practice of fertility medicine and IVF in the UK. We, going on their website, we can see that obviously ELD features in their list of licensed uh, conditions for this diagnosis. It's been one of the first conditions that has been on this list. And currently we have 22 UK clinics on the HFEA list which are licensed to do this condition, half of which are in central London. Um, PGD, or pre-implantation genetic diagnosis, is currently an indication for treatment in our clinic in about 0.4% of all IVF cycles, as most of the patients that we see are not patients that we see for PGD, but patients that we see for infertility. The success rate limiting step when it comes to genetic diagnosis uh, through the means of PGD is the fact that these couples will need to go through an IVF cycle. And the IVF cycle is not perfect science. Yeah, there is a great attrition rate when it comes to offering couples IVF. We get many eggs. Not all eggs will be mature not all mature eggs will fertilize, and not all fertilized embryos will eventually implant in the uterus. Consequently, when we look at our database in 2013 from the European Society of uh, Human Reproduction and Embryology, we were able to identify 460 patients who underwent a total 578 cycles for different genetic conditions. And when we assessed our success rates, most of the patients did not achieve a life birth, as the life birth rate per cycle started was about 25.6%. And this is similar to IVF success rates around the world, where the average success rate for a subfertile couple coming to have IVF under uh, uh, our care would have about a 30% chance of achieving a life birth after one attempt at IVF. It is an expensive treatment. Uh, and it has been quite a struggle in trying to incorporate this treatment into the NHS practice, but also to do it in an equal, consistent, and clear way for people coming from different parts of the country. Um, currently, the NHS will fund three cycles of IVF for the purposes of pre-implantation genetic diagnosis. The conditions they have set 
is that there should be no living <coughs> unaffected child in the current relationship so that the couple can be offered funding. And this treatment should take place in a valid, uh, had the tr in a center that has a valid HFEA license for this particular condition and for this particular treatment. And all these information is available at the HFEA website and at the NHS dot, uh, at the England.nhs.uk website when it comes to choosing which clinic um, someone should refer themselves to. Finally, as when it comes to the field of uh, fertility medicine and reproductive medicine, any new technology that uh, comes about and is very exciting at the beginning immediately creates some important ethical considerations and certainly PGD has been one of these uh, techniques. When we use pre-implantation genetic diagnosis through the means of just sexing the embryo, finding out if we're talking about a baby boy or a baby girl, immediately we are taking for granted that we'll be disposing of all male embryos. And that means that we might be disposing of, all, uh, of many healthy male embryos or we might be uh, in situations where the couple only have healthy male embryos available, but we will never know because we will dispose of all the male embryos through this technique. What happens if a couple have no unaffected embryos available? So what if we only have carrier female embryos? Do we proceed with the transfer or do we not proceed with the transfer? What can the couple decide in that case? The HFEA code of practice suggests that the mandatory requirements to proceed with this treatment would mean that if there is no unaffected embryo available, a carrier female embryo with ALD can be transferred inside the uterus after going through the process of a clinical ethics committee. Finally, social sexing is not allowed in the UK and there are very strict rules when it comes to this and to our practice. So what happens if a couple go through all this process and have unaffected male embryos available and unaffected female embryos available. Can they choose whether they want a boy or a girl? The answer is no. They, uh, essentially, what guides what we will decide or what we would advise the couple to do would mostly depend on the morphology and the quality of the available embryos. So when we have embryos that are unaffected by the condition, then the main thing that we would advise the couple to do is choose the embryo that has the highest implantation potential without taking into acknowledgement whether this is a boy or a girl. This is a small excerpt from the HFA Code of Practice which essentially summarizes this and puts it in writing where it, cl claim, it uh, states that the law prohibits the selection of an embryo for treatment if it is known to have a gene, chromosome, or mitochondrial abnormality with a significant risk for a genetic condition, or if it is of a sex that carries a particular risk that any child will have or develop a gender-related serious physical disability. However, this only applies if we have at least one surplus embryo that is not affected by this condition. Messages to take home from what we do is that this technique of pre-implantation genetic diagnosis uh, has been shown to have increasing safety, accuracy, and pregnancy rates are not fantastic, but they are gradually increasing with the newer techniques that we use. We are able to diagnose ALD status of an embryo prior to implantation. And finally, what I would uh, suggest and what I advise couples that we come to see us in our clinic is that we should maintain a realistic perspective. The science behind it is very exciting. But because these couples need to go through IVF treatment, uh, the success rates are low. And most of the couples that we will see eventually will not end up having a live birth because they have to undergo fertility treatment. Thank you very much for your time. It's been a pleasure.